I was just telling somebody the other day, I, I see in some ways Pope Francis is a gift to the church. Yep. <laughs> some, a difficult gift at times. The Pope has exerted power. And in doing so, he has undermined his authority. And I will say the McCarrick scandal was probably a big moment for me where I just said, okay, I, I can't just act like things are okay here anymore because it's so obvious they're not. I'm also one to say that that made me realize that the way JP2, God love him, the way he managed the church at times. And then frankly, um, Benedict resigning, it still hurts me this day because I felt like it's my father just saying, see you kids, I'm out. I honestly think it's very painful, but it's also very uh, healthy. The Pope, he's a celebrity, so he has authority. No, he has authority given to him by Jesus, but it's limited to these particulars, not to okay, he thinks this about climate change, therefore we have to think that about climate change. That's not, that's not how Catholicism works. Welcome back to Loopcast. Today I am joined by Eric Sammons. Eric is the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with your work over there. Crisis is America's leading source for Catholic perspectives on religion, politics, and culture. Uh, you know, as a, as a loop editor here, I might have to say second, second most leading source, but that's okay. We can, we can argue <laughs> about that later. <laughs> a little internecine conflict going on. In our wrestling contest. <laughs> yeah, right. He's also the host of Crisis Point, which uh, again, hopefully many of you listen to a weekly podcast um, that looks at you know, great interviews, great resource for just thinking about things happening in the church. So check that out. It will be in the show notes. And Eric, uh, we we uh, scheduled this prior to some breaking, jaw dropping news that fell upon the church mid November here, 2023. And of course, I'm talking about Bishop Strickland being removed from his diocese of Tyler, Texas. And at the at this point, it's not so much a breaking story, but uh, as someone who is in touch with Catholics in America, I would like to get your take on the impact that that news had on the church, on laity, clergy, bishops, what have you. So, I think the first thing we have to remember is that Bishop Strickland was the bishop of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas. And the reason I say that is because it has the greatest impact on the Catholics in Tyler, Texas. I, in fact, have an article uh, that will be up by the time this podcast goes live uh, by a layperson in the diocese talking about what a great bishop he was, that he really did have a connection with the people. He was not a bureaucrat in any sense of the term. I mean, she tells stories about how she'd be at a restaurant and he would see her from a distance and come over and talk to him, even though she wasn't like some, she was, I'm not a big donor. I'm not a big, I don't work at the diocese. Thing like that. She's just an, an average Catholic who's, who's trying her best to, to, to live the faith. And that's the kind of guy he was is, um, but that's kind of bishop he was in Tyler that, and, and they're just heartbroken there. And there are many, many Catholics who move to Tyler because of Bishop Strickland. I've heard right. many stories of people who heard him on the radio, heard him, uh, just from social media, where the case may be and thought, Hey, this is a place to live. I mean, cause, uh, Bishop Strickland is relatively young. He's in his early sixties. So if things had gone the way they should have gone, he would be the bishop there for another 15 years maybe and would have had a humongous impact on that diocese. Already it's had a big impact, but just have a tremendous impact on diocese. And so I think the first thing we have to think of is, 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 is the Catholics there in Tyler. That really is sad for them more than anybody else because he was their shepherd and now he's been taken away from, from them for really... I mean, no reason was given, but I think we all know for, for unjust reasons. And then beyond that, though, of course, Bishop Strickland had become one of the leading voices for Orthodox Catholicism in the church in America. I mean, he really is the, one of the go-to bishops who's, who stood up against a lot of the problems going on in the church. I mean, the, the most prominent one, the one that got him probably the beginning of his troubles is when we spoke out after the McCarrick scandal about the presence of homosexuality in the priesthood, about the fact that the church was not really speaking out against homosexual activity, was, was coddling people like Father James Martin, uh, even endorsing him. And, and he just said, what are we doing here? Do we believe what the church teaches? And that was so refreshing for, for us Catholics to hear yeah. a bishop speak 
like a, a shepherd. Well, not just speak, stole. but in front of all the other bishops, he stood up. Yes. And your uh, Kevin Wells had a great piece at Crisis. Actually, I encourage everyone to check it out. He highlights that incident. He stood up in front of the bishops, my brothers, you know. So great and, moment. And it really worked courageous because it it's naturally, I mean, an organization like the USCCB is naturally kind of an old boys club. I mean, it almost can't literally. Help it. It's like <laughs> and uh, it's like the Senate, which is the really, really old boys club yeah. um, where you, you just basically, it's very difficult to speak against or in any way challenge your brother bishops, but he did that. And he was at this point, he's very, he was very obscure, just a, a nobody in the ranks of the Episcopate. Tyler's a podunk he, diocese. Like, yeah, it really yeah. is. I mean, really, I mean, who, 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 I mean, no, I don't think anybody had really heard of him before. And so I think it was him continuing to do that. It really was encouraging to Catholics outside of the diocese of Tyler, because it was like, okay, it's just very heartening when we see a shepherd lead his sheep and, and speak forthrightly, because that's what we're begging all of our bishops to do. And, and when he did that now, of course, going forward, it's not like he's not a bishop. I mean, he's still a, a, a bishop. He just doesn't have a jurisdiction that he's over, so he can still speak out, which is good. Uh, I, I think it's just an, I mean, honestly, it's like an awkward situation here because we have one of the best bishops in our country who has been removed from office uh, for, for no reason officially given. And, and we all know it seems to be a political type of thing. And it just really is an awkward situation that, I mean, at the USCCB meetings, He's outside and they're all in their meeting talking about who knows what. And so it really is. Um, I mean, I think all of us naturally have feelings of, of anger and, and, and sorrow about this. I think we have to channel that properly, but at the same time, it's okay. I, I, I think that's something we have to remember. We can't live in anger. We can't live and just be angry Catholics all the time. Ob obviously not. But at the same time, there is a such thing as righteous anger, and it is legitimate. Our Lord got angry, and so if he got angry, it obviously isn't always a sin to be angry. I just think we have to have the right balance of, yes, we can be angry about it, but what do we do in response? Do we just throw a fit? Do we get on social media and just complain all the time? Or do we go back and do what Bishop Strickland suggests that we do, which is pray, uh, make sacrifices, and, and speak up and work. I mean, this isn't a call to silence that we all just shut up about it, but we, we do it to speak out like you're doing. It, like Catholic Vote does a great job of that, uh, just speaking up about what's going on in the world and how, how Catholics should, should act in, in these times. Right. Yeah, and I think it, it's interesting, too, some of the reports coming out of the USCCB meeting, uh, you know, people with feet on the ground, reporters, the pillars doing a great job with this uh, as well. It's that even... It's definitely, Strickland is top of mind for a lot of the bishops, and not just the bishops who you would think would normally align themselves with him. Like, even they're saying, even bishops who would be critical of Strickland himself and not agree with like going on social media or criticizing the Pope in the way that he has done in some ways. Um, but they're saying, you know, this move from the from Francis, I mean, it must have been Francis who removed him because only the Pope himself can just tromp all over canon law the way that's been done here. Um, but even they're saying, you know, whoa, wait a minute, this is this is a disturbing exercise of papal authority. And so I was wondering, not that not that we're all Catherine of Siena level, you know, holiness here, but what kind what basically, I know the Pope can do this, right? Like, obviously, he did. He doesn't have to follow canon law. He can just do what he wants regardless. But what does a decision like this coming from Francis, and it's not the first time he's done it. We think of Puerto Rico, we think of Paraguay. What, does the, what message does this send to the bishops, to Catholics, when you, when you see a power play like this coming from Rome? Right. It, it's the Pope has exerted power and in doing so he has undermined his authority yeah. because I think those two things are separate things because power is the ability to do something and he has the power to do something. Authority is different because that's something that you're given to by Christ and you're to use it for the common good and you're to use it for the good of the church. And I think in this case, what he's doing is he's using his power. Like you said, he does have the power to do what he did. I mean, Vatican I made very clear that the, that the Pope has universal jurisdiction and immediate jurisdiction over the church. However, popes have always understood that bishops also have a direct authority that comes from Jesus Christ. 
they're not just middle managers, agents of the Pope, but they really are directly connected by Jesus to their diocese. And so popes in the past have always been very reticent to ever try to uh, just remove a bishop for, without a very serious cause. And in fact, canon law makes it clear that it really needs to be a canonical crime. Again, yes, a pope can kind of trump canon law, but at the same time, what it does though is it's, it's really by going around canon law, he, the, the pope is, is making it that we have a disrespect for the law. Because it's like, oh yeah, he doesn't even bother following its directives. When if he did follow the directives, then we'd say, okay, even the Pope is saying, listen, we have to follow canon law. We have to do these things. But he's not saying that. He's just like, I don't like this guy. I'm going to remove him. And I think it really does. I think this is what the bishops uh, are worried about. Even the ones who might not be fans of Strickland, is it undermines their authority because they're just looked upon as nothing more than just bureaucratic middle managers, but they really, they're apostles of, they're, they're successors of the apostles of Jesus Christ. I mean, they really do have a authority. And we already have a problem that a lot of Catholics look to the local bishop as somebody they don't really pay attention to or don't think is very important. And this guilty. just makes it more. Yeah, I know. And I'm, yeah, I'll put it in my hand. I'm, I'm guilty of that too. But I've, that's something I have feel like, um, the, the, the Francis era has really impressed upon me is that connection that Catholics should have to the local bishop. That even when he's not great, you know, necessarily doing a great job or he's just doing maybe a, a kind of a midway job or something like that, that we really look to them as they are our direct pastors, not the Pope, but really they are. They are our shepherds or direct shepherds. But when this happens, it just undermines all that. It undermines a proper understand a proper Catholic ecclesiology, a theology of the church of understanding how authority is, is, is given and granted and wielded in the church. So I can see why bishops, even aren't, who aren't fans of Strickland, would be very worried about this because it just does make their job harder, frankly, because why bother to even listen to them on anything? Just like, oh, I'll just go to Rome. I'll just listen to what they say and everything just comes out of whatever comes out of Rome is all that matters. But really, it's the bishop on the ground who is supposed to understand his people directly. Pope Francis does not understand the, the goings on of a Catholic in Ohio where I live or, or Florida or Texas or something like that. That's not his fault. Of course he doesn't. But the B Bishop Strickland in Texas or my bishop, Archbishop Schnur or somebody like that, they, they are supposed to then know they're the boots on the ground, so to speak. They they are with the people, so they're supposed to be at least. Supposed to smell like the sheep, right? They're supposed to smell like the sheep. But if everything is just given out of Rome, I mean, we saw that with like the, the one of the, I can't remember which one it was, one of the, the directives out of the Vatican about that you couldn't put an ad in your bulletin for the traditional Latin math. I mean, it was like, yeah. it's like, come on. It's now after the Mochi Rome, Proprio, yeah. Yeah, yeah right, right. Hey, 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 what's in the, what's in our bulletins? I mean, that just, that's a ludicrous system practically speaking really and it does not help the, the sheep uh in in living out the faith yeah it's very confusing and i think you know the whole francis papacy leading up to this i mean i spent probably eight years being like we need to be patient with him give it the most charitable interpretation blah 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 but you know one of the fruits of it is that in the last few years kind of watching the directives come out of rome I have been more inspired to pray for the Pope. I mean, with growing up under John Paul II and then Benedict, I, I kind of neglected that a little because I'm like, well, these guys, you know, they're all set. They don't really need my prayers. But um, <laughs> life, life has shown me the opposite. But I do remember among, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, conservative Catholics throughout the John Paul II papacy. So, you know, when I'm in college, going up through early years of marriage, um, a tendency to dismiss the local bishop if you didn't like him and just say, well, John Paul, like guy behind me, John Paul, he's in charge. He's going to just take care of it. And he he did. People criticized him for being heavy handed. But but this kind of a move where you just come in and and remove a bishop without canonical process. We didn't see that under him. Yeah. JP2 never did that. In fact, he had a situation <laughs> where a, a big bishop of Seattle was doing a terrible job and had all right. these problems and really causing problems. And he ended up appointing an auxiliary bishop, which was in a being done in a world to basically, I know exactly, um, not the best choice, but, but the point is he did respect the idea that he's not just going to kick out in, in, in a bishop out of his diocese, unless there's a real true, like canonical crime, I mean, abusing children or something like that. If it's just, 
other than that, he, they're just not going to do it. But I do think you bring up a good point about conservative Catholics. I, mean, I became Catholic under JP2 mm-hmm. in the early 90s. Me too, yeah. And so, yeah. And so, you know, obviously he's a big hero and all of that. And I think, though, that is that was laziness on our part in our apologetic that we were just like, well, the Pope said this. Like, for example, I mean, we do that sometimes with, like, for example, uh, the teaching against artificial contraception. We talk about how Paul VI declared Humea Vitae. And that's true, but what Paul VI was doing is he's simply reaffirming the tradition, the teaching of the church. It's always been the teaching. And so it's not that G- that Paul VI banned contraception. It's that he affirmed what the church has always taught. And there's reasons why the church always taught that. And so it's a lazy move. And I'm saying this as somebody who's done it, so I can I can be the first to say it. It's a lazy move to say, well, Pope John Paul II said, that, like like the uh, prohibition against women priests, same right. thing. I mean, it was good that JP2 issued that document in the 90, 1994, I think it was. I'm not saying you shouldn't have done that, but as Catholics, we should have made sure we understood. And in fact, if you look at what JP2 writes, he's saying, I'm basing it upon what has been has been handed on to me. I'm not inventing this as a new rule. But I think a lot of us were like, well, JP2 closed the door, so it, that that's all said and done. But no, we have to understand this has always been the way it is. And so I think that's something that Francis has opened our eyes to, that the, the knee-jerk, the Pope said this, and therefore it's true, is it a, it's a not a good apologetic move. It's not a good uh, understanding of the faith because all popes are supposed to do is reiterate and repeat and, and proclaim what has already been taught and what has been handed on to us. So I was just telling somebody the other day, I, I see in some ways Pope Francis is a gift to the church, yep. <laughs> some, a difficult gift at times, but one that, that hopefully can help us as Catholics grow deep in our understanding of not only the role of the Pope, I've written a lot about that at Crisis, but also just our understanding of how our teachings come to us through scripture and tradition, they're handed on to us. And, and it's not something that is that the, the Pope is the Lord of, but instead he's the servant of that. Mm-hmm. So you touched a little bit on you, you're a convert, you come from Protestant background. And so this isn't, this whole messy church is not the church you were born into. You chose this. Um, I was hoping you could share with us a little bit about your conversion story. So you you were formerly Protestant, uh, as Michael Knowles would say. How Protestant were you, and what sparked the yeah, yeah. conversion? Yeah, I was. I was. De- we. I grew up in a United Methodist Church, but then in in high school, I had a conversion experience where I I made an altar call at a, at a youth at a youth conference, uh, gave my life to Jesus pers- as my personal Lord and Savior. And I really was an evangelical Protestant, uh, very um, serious about my faith, very in- involved in it. Uh, I, I was a member of Campus Crusade for Christ for a while. We share the four spiritual laws on the beaches, and all. I didn't, I wasn't cool enough to be on the beach there, but I, you know, <laughs> from door to door and things like that. But yeah, so I was very involved with that. But that also got me involved in the pro life movement, and that's where I met Catholics, and that's where I really got involved. Uh, like, just got understanding Catholics and living with them and understanding that they're Christians as well. I didn't really know much about Catholicism growing up. We just kind of ignored it more than anything. They were the people who went to mass sometimes on Saturday evening, which is weird. I mean, that's kind of how I wrote it. I mean, that was my extent. But hanging out with these Catholics in the pro-life movement really got me to uh, learn about Catholicism and eventually uh, to convert to Catholicism. And that was 1993 is the year I came into the church. And I will be honest, I I, if I knew then what I know now, without all the graces I've been given through the sacraments, maybe I wouldn't have converted. I admit it freely because I was a little bit blinded. I, I didn't really understand that there was problems in, you know, after Vatican II and all that stuff. And I, all I saw was JP II. Yeah. I wouldn't even have known the name of the, the, the I, I might not even remember the name of the Archbishop of Cincinnati when I came into the church, to be honest. But I knew who JP2 was, loved him, went to World Youth Day uh, in Denver uh, five, six months after I came into the church, Amazing. which was like the most incredible experience when all of a sudden you just became Catholic. And now all of a sudden you're with hundreds of thousands of Catholics. You're wa- walking down the street and there's like bishops walking by you and you're, you know, all this stuff. And it's just like, it was insane. And so it was very, uh, you know, Catholic Woodstock, so to speak, <laughs> but it was, it was great. And, and so over time though, the, I remember. Some of the apologetics that happened while I was Protestant becoming Catholic 
had to keep coming back to mind. Like, for example, as a Protestant, I had some of the misconceptions about Catholics towards the Pope that he was basically like a cult leader, that he was somebody who was always right about everything, infallible in everything he said or did. And I remember reading things like from Catholic Answers and from uh, and my friends would tell me that, no, no, that's not how it works. We don't think all popes are perfect. We happen to have a very good one right now, but that doesn't mean we can't have bad ones. And they explain it. And to me, intellectually in my head, I was like, okay. But emotionally, I think I didn't really buy that because we have JP too. Right. And then when Benedict became Pope, I liked him even more. Even I would, better, be right. <laughs> it's just progress. I, mean, I, 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 I was a huge Ratzinger fan. Yep. I read all of his stuff. And, you know, I just thought it was amazing. So I remember, I remember jumping down my kids' are It was crazy when he became Pope. And so it was still theoretical. It was still academic in my head, the idea of, of a pope that wasn't doing a very good job, like actually being a possibility. I mean, yeah, I read the history book, but there's a difference between reading history books and then living under it. And so over the years, I, I was like you, I, I worked very hard to give Francis the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I had friends who were pretty quickly kind of turned on him, I guess you oh could say. Gosh, and I'd be yeah. like, no, no, no. And I'd be like, let's try, you know, he- Or even left the church. I mean- <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. And I really was like, okay, let's not do it. But then I, I do think over time, and I will say the McCarrick scandal was probably a big moment for me where I just said, okay, I, I can't just act like things are okay here anymore because it's so obvious they're not. That the way the church is managed right now, right, it was a disaster. And, and I'm also one to say that that made me realize that the way JP2, God love him, the way he managed the church at times, like picking car, um Donald World, you know, things like that. You know, all you know, McCarrick raised up, uh, the the Legionaries of Christ, uh, Massiel, the, the founder, all that stuff. You know, he made a lot of mistakes as well. And then you could also, and then frankly, um, Benedict resigning, it still hurts me this day. I mean, I still feel like that's a, uh, like it's a personal wound to me. And I, I, I don't think I'll ever yeah. recover fully from it because I felt like it's my father just saying, see you kids, I'm out. Yeah, that's one of my like top three questions for Jesus when I die. What happened with Benedict? That's <laughs> like way up there. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think all these things have kind of, and I I honestly think it's very painful, but it's also very uh, healthy mm -hmm. because it's, it's allowed us hopefully to see what is the role of the Pope in the church? What is the role of or the bishops? What is the role, our role? In, in proclaiming the faith and passing it on. I mean, I think uh, uh, my friend Timothy Flanders, he made the point that tradition starts in the home, in that that's where you receive the faith. That is your your primary thing, it, it, uh, way you receive the, the faith is from your parents and then from your pastor. And in 99.9% .9 of the time, it should never go beyond that. It should just be you, your family, and your pastor. Yes, sometimes maybe something come or the bishop has to get involved. And then on those rare, like once in a hundred year occasions, maybe the Pope has to get involved because it's so serious. But, and that's something that I think, I mean, John Paul II was so personally charismatic. He couldn't help himself. I mean, that's just who he was. And so we had this, this celebrity Pope. And, and I think, and, and like I said, trust me, John Paul II did great work. I, great work. I became Catholic partly because of him, all these JP2 priests and all that. I get all that. But I do think it's it became a little bit dangerous in our mentality to say, okay, that we kind of consider the Pope as the celebrity that we have to like we like you know how people listen to the the Kardashians or whoever <laughs> I, off in my head. Not the you know, analogy I was going to go to, but Kardashians work. I get what you're saying. Yeah, okay, it's celebrities that they now <laughs> right. have an authority. That's right. Kind of how we look at the Pope, he's a celebrity, so he has authority. No, he has authority given to him by Jesus, but it's limited to these particulars, not to, okay, he thinks this about climate change. Therefore, we have to think that about climate change. That's not, that's not how Catholicism works. And that's something that we're, we're hopefully Catholics are, are, are beginning to understand more and more. Yeah. So break it down for me. You're a dad of six and seven. I think seven. Oh, that's awesome. I'm, we're about to welcome our seventh. So yay. Oh, congratulations. Uh, hey, thanks. This is a very good biblical, perfect number. It I was is. just actually yep. called Bishop this weekend. 
And I was telling my seven kids, it's the first thing he said. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Good number. I was the like, number Thank of you, fulfillment. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, that's true. Right. Oh, I'm just thinking on the seventh child, we rest like God rested on the seventh day. Right? <laughs> right. Is that what happens? You don't get any rest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> darn it. <laughs> uh, so, so break it down for me. You know, you're you're raising kids, and one of one of my big concerns when scandal breaks in the church, and I have teenagers who are aware of what's going on, is how do you help them? Uh, and I think it's a good exercise, too, because, you, you know, most adult Catholics in the pew, they want this at like a sixth grade level. So what is the role of the pope? And how would you just put it into into terms? So the other way I'm thinking about it is we use the Baltimore Catechism in our homeschool. And it says, you know, the church is the communion of all baptized believers, united in the same true faith, same sacrifice under the Holy Father, the pope. What does under mean? Right. So a, a few things. I, I think the, the 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 primary thing is that he is this, he is called to be the center of unity. And what that means is that in any organization, I mean, any human organization, you you have to have some way it stays united. And we see this, for example, with Protestantism in in the opposite extreme, because it has no center of unity, it just falls apart, and we have tens of thousands of Protestant denominations that believe all these different things. You see it on a much lesser level. You still see it in orthodoxy somewhat because like, for example, right now, Moscow and Constantinople are actually basically not communing with each other. They're potentially going their own ways. And so you don't have a center of unity there. So what we have is we have the Pope as the center of unity. The main way I, I would say he, he practices that and he exemplifies that is he is that court of final appeal. That if there is a case where there is dispute within the church, whether or not do we believe this or do we believe that, and it, it continues to rise and there's really discussion, debate, there has to be a way for that debate to stop. Like, for example, just to, to consider orthodoxy. Orthodoxy, they some orthodox are very much against artificial contraception. Others accept it. Well, that's a problem because it's either it's it's moral or it's not. But they don't have a center of unity that can kind of make the final declaration of okay, definitely this is against church teaching, and, and we're gonna we're gonna make sure that's clear. And so as Catholics, we have that. But note the the direction things flow. I think this is an important point. They flow from the people, kind of, and and we 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 pass on the faith, we live the faith. And then if things start to get out of line, like all of a sudden, let's say a priest starts preaching something that, that's off about the faith or something like that, and it becomes more popular, more people start following it, it kind of rises up and the local bishop should say, hold on a second, that's not right. But maybe, the local, maybe another bishop says, well, I think that's okay. And it, it starts to cause dissension and problems in the church. Then eventually it gets to the papacy. And that is actually the main reason we have that, that, that the Pope has the gift of the charism of infallibility, because what it does, it tells us that when he finally, if he has to finally get involved and say, this is the teaching of the church, then we know it's final. We don't have to continue debating that. And so that's really the, the principal point that he's making is now we're all unified again, that center of unity in the church. But what it's not is the problem is, if you, as you notice, it kind of percolates up to him and he finally says, okay, we're done. It's not the other way around. It's not that the Pope is determining, okay, what is it we all believe? And I'm going to tell everybody what we all believe. And we're, I'm just going to declare here and there, okay, well, now we believe this about that. Now we believe this about that. He's more than that court of la uh, final appeal rather than the, the, the dictator who's telling everybody, this is what you have to believe. Okay. I'm just going to stop you for a second. You're blowing my mind because, okay, we're, we just went through this whole synodal thing. Yeah. And what you're describing seems to me exactly the opposite of the direction the synodal synod, synod of the synods of the meetings is taking us because Francis is saying there's going to be there's no decision there's no final anything we're just going to converse our, about our experiences and you know 3 years ago I said it you can't bless same sex unions and now 3 years later Maybe we can, and the synodals will say what we, we can and we can't do, but they won't really because there is no, the dialogue, the, the, the pilgrimage is the point. So is Francis abdicating that principle of unity that you're describing? It's almost upside down world. It is. And I think, frankly, I think he's abusing 
the authority he has. And in 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 the sense that, for example, like I mean, the Strickland is a perfect example of abusing it. But he is becoming the the source. He's trying to make himself, frankly, the source of our teachings. Because you notice the whole synodal way, which to be blunt, is the whole thing's kind of a sham because it is. Well, Strickland talks proves about, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it does. I mean, because ultimately all that matters in the end, and this is what they think all that matters, is what the Pope will then write after the synods are over. The same thing happened with the 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 the, the synods on the family in Amor Sotitia. Nobody even remembers anything that was said actually at the synod on the family. Nobody even cares. All that matters was the the the, the papal document that came out. But that's a problem because it's the Pope basically inserting himself in and saying, I'm going to now direct things in a new direction. I now think that divorce and remarriage should get should be able to receive communion under certain circumstances. Even though JP2, when he it was interesting, when JP2 said that divorce and remarriage cannot receive communion back in 1982, I think it was, he said, he made it very clear, I am simply saying this is what we've always done. This has been the practice since the time of Jesus. Jesus said this, St. Paul said this, and this has been the practice. I am repeating that and saying, this is what we, we have to keep doing. That's being a servant of the servants of God. That's being a servant of the tradition. A steward, right. Mm-hmm. Yes, a steward, exactly. Whereas Pope Francis is reversing that. He's saying, we've done all this in the past, but now we're in a new situation. So I say we're going to do it differently. He did, he's doing the same thing with the death penalty, of course. Right. And so what he's doing, he's he's reversing the whole process. And he's saying, I'm going to now determine what we is that we we teach instead of I'm going to resolve debates that are already that, that somehow are, are arising. Because remember, divorce, I mean, communion for divorce and married actually isn't a debate. It's a settled teaching. It's settled practice of the church for 2000 years. They just all of a sudden make it. They say, oh, this is now a debate in the church. And now the Pope's going to decide on it. But they, it wasn't actually a debate because when we talk about the, 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 the census fidelium, we have to remember, it's not just people alive today. It's all Catholics. It's all Catholics. And we're outnumbered by our, our, our fathers and mothers in the faith. And they're the ones who have always said, this is how we've always done things. And so I think that's, that's a real reversal. And that's why I do think that Francis ends up abusing um, the, the, the authority that, that's given to him. And, and it, it really does then make, and you see this, unfortunately, with a lot of Catholics. They just are like, well, I believed X yesterday, but now Pope Francis says X, not X, so I'm going to believe not X today. But it's like, wait a minute, why did you believe X in the first place? Was it because that's what always has been taught? Well, then you need to keep believing that because the Pope can't abrogate that. And, and in fact, Vatican I, when it declares the, the, the authority of the Pope in both universal jurisdiction and infallibility, it says that Jesus gave to Peter these keys, not so that he might create new doctrine, but that he would simply pass on the revelation, give, not, not new revelation, but that he would pass on the deposit of faith. And so that's like a, a key to understanding Vatican I and a key to understanding that the limits, and this is what people are saying is, there are definite limits on papal authority by, de- by Vatican I. I mean, this isn't something like, all of a sudden I'm a Protestant, I'm making this up. No, Vatican I states that there are limits on papal authority. And this Pope seems to be hard pressed to try to, to push those and, and, and kind of jump over those and, and go around those. Yeah. And it seems like it's at a moment when, at least in the Western church, we're at, we have a particular vulnerability because catechesis has been so poor for the last 50, 60 years that, like you said, people see, oh, the Pope changed it. OK, because they there's that there isn't that sense of grounding um, and things are upside down uh, when people are ignorant of their faith. So, wow, man, kudos. So I, always, I try to end end interviews on a, a positive note. So for people who don't want to fall into that trap and would like to be as well educated as you, could you give us some of like your favorite books? favorite movies um let's give you we're going to limit you to maybe your top three books that had an influence on you in your faith boy i've got just hundreds and hundreds that's of why books. i'm giving you know three hard, <laughs> it's not hard people like me the same issue yeah one book that was very instrumental to me when i first became catholic was theology and sanity by frank sheed that was my dad's catalyst no way that's awesome Yes, it, it was a beautiful, a beautiful book, and it explained. I mean, like I personally think that Frank Sheed's explanation of the Trinity in that book is the best English language 
X Smith and Tretti in, in ever. And in fact, I was teaching, um, I, I went in to teach one of the classes for RCA class at our parish recently, and I was supposed to cover the Trinity. So I talked about it very briefly, but then I printed out that description from Frank Sheed. And I just said, this is the, the, the one to go to. Um, another, now this is a book that just comes up with me because I just, I just love it so much. And I, I don't even know how much it applies to anything going on today, but I love C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. I just think that is, and I mean, that one, what it do, did for me was it really helped me to understand that people, if, if somebody goes to hell, they choose it, that they've actually chosen it. It's not God being the big meanie up there and saying, I'm going to send you here. I'm going to send you, you know, I like you. I like your hair. So I'm going to send you to heaven. I don't like you. And so I'm going to send you to hell. It's, it's not, it's, it's very arbitrary. And I think that's a difficult subject in modern times. People really struggle with, with hell at the existence of it, that why would a loving God ever send anybody there? And I think C.S. Lewis, who obviously wasn't Catholic, but, and, and he even says, that he's not trying to do theology here, but I just thought it was a, a, a beautiful book. Um, the other one is a, a book on my, one of my favorite saints, St. Francis of Assisi, um, and it's by Felix Timmermans, and I'm blanking on the name of the, oh, Perfect Joy of St. Francis, The Perfect Joy of St. Frank. And I just, that book was just, I, I, it just, I love reading saints books. In fact, one of the things I do is it, my wife and I do as parents is once our kids get to be, I think it's first communion age, they are allowed to stay up a half hour later than they were. And, they, but they have to read a book of, on the saints, a uh, saint, or they can read from the Bible. They do it every night. And because I really think reading the saints is so important because it understands how people live their faith in different various challenges and times. And St. Francis of CC, I, I just love, I mean, you see behind me, I have the, the crucifix there, St. Francis embracing Christ on the cross. And so that book was my favorite. I and mean, there's a billion and one books on St. Francis of CC. Uh, but I, I like that one the best, The Perfect Joy of St. Francis, because I really felt like it brought out who Frank St. Uh, St. Francis is. That's awesome. I, I need to read a good book on St. Francis because I'm a Dominican girl myself. So I, I need to explore the Franciscan. I will hold that I'll check you. it out. Okay, that's all right. Well, you know, we can come to a commonality here. Um, that's right, that's all right. right. The other thing I wanted to ask you in particular, because you do so many amazing interviews on Crisis Point of Catholics doing great stuff, really brilliant thinkers. So if you could pick like your top favorite, favorite interviews you've done on Crisis Point. I, I interview Bishop Strickland. Um, that, of course, is very good. Uh, I, I love Joseph Pierce. I think he's just the greatest. And I, when I interviewed him on whether or not uh, Shakespeare was Catholic, I just think I, I, I just I thought that because I like I love Shakespeare. Uh, you know, I also love being Catholic, and so his his take on that is great. And so Joseph Pierce is probably um, one of my favorites uh, that I've interviewed. And and like I said though. Uh, I, 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 I interviewed, um, Bishop Strickland, I, Bishop Athanasius Schneider. I, I really, you know, I, I love him to death and I've interviewed him a couple of times and, uh, I, I like it when I interview the people who are just like regular though, um, just living out the faith. Like I interviewed somebody from the Veritas Splendor community in Tyler. This is before this came out about yeah, Strickland. Jason, he works for Catholic boat. Yeah. Well, okay, great. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. So, I mean, you, know, you just people, just Catholics trying to live out their faith. I think it's a, a good thing we all um, have to deal with. But, but I, I, I have a, I have a soft spot for Joseph Pierce. I think she, just yeah, think he's the his greatest. accent's great too. I mean, yeah, I know I Americans are just obsessed with British accents, but he's really fun to listen to. <laughs> so, I don't know what it is. It is. It's great. It's true. All right. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your time. This has been a great conversation, and um, yeah, we'll continue to pray for the church. Pray for our Pope and uh, and for the good work that Crisis is doing in the church. Thank you very much, Erica. I appreciate it.